the question uh, was uh, was asked by journalists that came to uh, the Ogallala Lakota Nation, commonly called Pine Ridge, which is the place where Wounded Knee is located. Uh, in 1973, they always asked the question, what is the American Indian Movement and, and what is going on at Wounded Knee? And uh, I think this, uh, in these words, by Killstraight, Virgil Killstraight, um, in response to Richard LaCourse's question, goes something like this, which I think uh, appropriately answers the whole question about the American Indian Movement exploding on the scene in 1968. and how we've changed things forever and brought back this whole spiritual cultural rebirth or spiritual cultural renaissance. Uh, Kilstrate said something like this, things will never be the same again and that's what the American Indian Movement is all about. They are respected by many, hated by some, but they are never ignored. They are the catalyst for Indian sovereignty. They intend to raise questions in the minds of all, questions that have gone to sleep in the minds of Indians and non-Indians alike. AIM was born because a few knew that it was enough, enough to endure for themselves and all others like them who were people without power or rights. From the outside, AIM people are a tough people, they had to be. The American Indian Movement was born out of the dark violence of police brutality and the voiceless despair of Indian people in the courts of Minneapolis, Minnesota. AIM people have known the insides of jails, the long wait the no appeal of the courts for Indian people because many of them were there. From the inside, AIM people are cleansing themselves. Many have returned to the old traditional teachings, ceremonies, way of life of their tribes, away from the confused notions of a society that had made them slaves of their own unguided lives. AIM is first a spiritual movement, a religious rebirth, and then the rebirth of dignity and pride in a people. AIM succeeds because they have beliefs to act upon. The American Indian Movement is attempting to connect the realities of the past with the promise of tomorrow. They are a people in a hurry because they know that the dignity of a person can be snuffed by despair and a belt in a cell of a city jail. They know that the deepest hopes of the old people could die with them. They know that the Indian way is not tolerated in white America because it is not acknowledged as a decent way to be. Sovereignty, land, and culture cannot endure if a people is not left in peace. The American Indian Movement is then the warrior's class of this century who are bound to the bond of the drum, who vote with their bodies instead of their mouths, their business is hope. This is what uh, Virgil Kilstraight uh, had to say about this movement. And I think in those words, it best describes this movement and the importance of this movement, the historical event that took place in Minneapolis on July 19, 1968, when a group of men, women, students, youth, elders came together to form what was to become known as the American Indian Movement. In the early 70s, our people sensed right away that there was something missing from this movement. What was it? What is it about 
being an Indian person, an indigenous person. And people came to realize in their vision that it was language, culture, traditional spiritual way of life and ceremonies, and a value system that had survived generation to generation among our people until that was disrupted by the Christian missionaries, the white educators, and the federal government, who we declared very early on as the three main enemies of Indian people, and for obvious reasons. Because their whole plan was to completely destroy the Indian physically through death marches, starvation, destroying our food supply, cutting down our orchards, wiping out the buffalo. They found out through military aggression they could not eradicate us, even though that was their intent. And so then decided the best way to do it, somebody even said, save the man, destroy the Indian. I don't know who said that, but somebody said that, one of them yeah. bureaucrats. Save the man, destroy the Indian. In other words, that was the policy, to send the educators out to teach us their history, which is a very short history in this land, and a very sordid history in the countries of their origins. They were the persecuted right. who came here. And, uh, and to take us away from our spiritual leaders, to discredit, demean, degrade our spiritual leaders. Many of our leaders were taken off to prisons like Alcatraz and Leavenworth, and through neglect, ill health and abuse, many of them died in prisons. That was their policy, to take the leadership, assassinate the crazy horses, the sitting bulls, the uh, uh, Wabanaquat, our great chief, to assassinate our leaders, the ones they couldn't assassinate, to take them off and put them in prison, and the others through the use of the church, education, and the federal bureaucracy to destroy our spiritual and cultural way of life. And the church has played a role today on most of the reservations with the exception of the elders and they do have a responsibility to continue providing for them elders that they've got in their church but through the American Indian movement of coming to life in 1968 I say coming to life because there was an American Indian movement resistance when Columbus the colonial pirate got off the boat and the pilgrims got off the boat at Plymouth Rock the American Indian Movement was a manifestation of that long struggle which erupted and one of the first things that happened in the early 70s we started to seek out those traditional elders women and men who had maintained and kept these ceremonies and the language and the prayer songs intact and so it was seen then that the American Indian Movement is first a spiritual movement a religious rebirth and then the rebirth of dignity and pride in a people. And our worst detractors today will tell you that the American Indian Movement sparked this renaissance. The powwow as we know it today in the Ojibwe language, ni mi ed de win, means a time to come together to pray, to give thanks, to feast, to dance, to have our music, uh, socialize, talk about politics, the powwow uh, was almost, had almost disappeared in many parts of the country until the American Indian Women sparked this renaissance. I have a couple more questions now out of the things you've just been saying here. First of all, going back to White Earth for a moment, uh, about how many people do you think lived, lived at White Earth, you know, when you were growing up there? How I large? think our current population, uh, tribal members of the White Earth uh, uh, Nation only, is about 26,000 members. And I think as I was growing up as a child, there were probably uh, more living there then. Uh, could be as high as 10, 15,000. But because of the conditions uh, of poverty and no jobs, no opportunity, uh, many of our young people who are fortunate enough to graduate from high school or go to college, they oftentimes have to leave and migrate into uh, 
ver various urban communities such as, in this case, Minneapolis and St. Paul, where there are some employment opportunities. Uh, I would think that today there's no more than 4,500 of our people living uh, right on the, within the boundaries of the White Earth Ojibwe Nation. Uh, however, our people are, um, we're rooted there. Um, many people go back and forth. They go up to the family events, uh, uh, celebrations, powwows, uh, fishing, uh, collecting the manomen, the wild rice, uh, berry picking. Uh, some maintain homes up there and continue to travel back and forth from various cities where they're where they have employment uh, but probably uh, uh, over the years that I can recall say 50 years there was probably never any more than 10,000 people living on the reservation um, and I would say as I said earlier that's probably down to about 4,500 today. So the 26,000, that is people living all throughout wherever they're living. All over but, the world. But they are, are they registered? Oh, yeah. Is, is, well, we'll get into that a little later. Yeah, on we have we get into uh, the... citizenship membership, you know, citizenship. Uh, uh, you know, we, we're not only citizens of our own nation, sovereign citizens, but... In 1924, by an act of Congress, unilaterally and arbitrarily, uh, they declared us to be American citizens. 1924. Uh, they were supposed to ask us. They never did. Uh, had they asked, we would have said, well, uh, what rights does that give us that we don't already have? And what would they have told us? Oh, they would have probably said, well, you can go off and fight in our wars and you can uh, pay taxes. <laughs> well, we just said, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, we don't need that. Even though, as I said earlier, in the First World War, 60,000 American Indians went off and fought uh, for America. And, of course, in all of America's wars, our people have served with valor in all of America's wars, including the recent wars. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that I strongly feel that this is patriotism misplaced. And I've often said that when our people uh, become as patriotic to their own nation, their own Indian nation, and our struggle, uh, then we will really start making some, some gains. But, uh, um, uh, you know, until then, uh, I, you know, I don't consider myself an American citizen. That was imposed on us. I don't need it. I don't want it. Uh, I guess it's all right for those immigrants that came from all over the world who want to become Americanized and buy into that uh, condition, uh, but it's not for me. I don't need it. So when you say that it was only in 1924 that uh, citizenship was a, a blanket citizenship was mandated, what was the status of Native people prior to 1924? Well, obviously, we were not considered citizens of the United States. We were considered wards of the United States. Uh, typical colonialist, colonized relationship. Uh, sort of an arrogant sort of an attitude by the colonizer uh, who's seen us as children, wards of the, of the government. Um, and as such, they took themselves a trust responsibility to protect their children, their red children. Well, you can see how they protected us. I already explained how two-thirds of our land after the treaty-making period had disappeared. That's how they protected us. Uh, they were always interested in their own, their own interest. Uh, um, that's their priority, uh, not ours. So it's been a real bad relationship down through the years, and of course, uh, in the uh, Trail of Broken Treaties preamble to the manifesto itself, um, we took call for restitution, reparations, restoration of lands for reconstruction of an Indian future in America. When we talk about restitution, uh, uh, 
when we drafted that document in 1972, little did we know that for more than 100 years the government, because of this so-called trust relationship, have been collecting uh, uh, from the oil companies, the mineral companies, the ranchers, uh, been collecting lease payments uh, that were held in a federal trust account at the Treasury on behalf of individual Indian people who had lands allotted to them when they wanted to break up the tribal communal ownership of property to make it easier to steal. They allotted lands called the Allotment Act where they would give 60, 120 or uh, maybe more acres to uh, individual Indian people. Uh, and so the resources on that land, oil fields, gas fields, gold, minerals, uh, the government collected all this money and to date 137 billion and counting have disappeared from U.S. Treasury accounts. You know, it would be like, uh, you know, for the viewers here, I wanted to kind of give them an example I'm talking about. Uh, let's say that you entrusted your money to a bank and a banker and you decided you wanted to make an investment or you wanted to go on a vacation or you needed a few dollars to pay the bills. And you went to the bank and you said, uh, walked up to the teller cage and you said, I'd like to draw $25,000 out of my account. The teller would look at you puzzled and then he'd go back and bring the president out and, and she would tell him that Mr. Belcor wants to draw $25,000 out of his account. And the banker said, sorry, we don't have your money. We don't know where it went. And I would say then, well, what about the records, don't you? I have some, I have a book here that says I have this much here. What about your records? And the banker said, oh, we shredded those documents. Well, you would throw that banker in prison. And yet the United States government has done it to the tune of $137 billion and counting. So when we talk about restitution, we want all of that. We want to be paid for the oil companies stealing and passing up the passing up the meters, coming in in the night and taking tankers of crude out of the tanks. This has been going on, it's been rampant, but when the federal government tells you that they lost 137 billion and counting for over a hundred years, plus interest, we're talking about a lot of money here. Our people would not have been locked into chronic cycles of poverty if this federal government, who's supposed to be our trustee, was somebody that could be trusted. Obviously not. That's the case. So there were perhaps generations of people who lived in poverty while their money, they probably were completely unaware that their money was being paid. Who knows? Maybe we paid for the Second World War, the First World War. Maybe we paid for the Vietnam War. Maybe we paid for the war against Korea. Maybe we paid for the war against Iraq, Afghanistan, El Salvador, Nicaragua. Where did the money go? They can't tell us. The Secretary of the Interior, Gail Norton, and before that, the other Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, were both cited for civil contempt because they can't come up with our money. But no penalty. They get no, no penalty. penalties. They ought to throw them in prison, just like they ought to throw a banker in prison for doing the same thing. So uh, this is what we're faced with. This is the kind of relationship we have with this government of the United States. Fact is, in the Trail of Broken Treaties, as an introduction to the preamble, we said this to the U.S. government in 1972. We want a new relationship with you, an honest one. <clears throat> So, uh, going back again then to uh, the comment you made about different denominations being, it sounds like the reservation and the, the population of the reservation was carved up and parceled out to different denominations of Christians sure. to do whatever they were going to do. The biggest holder of Indian land today is the Catholic Church. Probably the Mormons are second and then the Episcopalians. But not only did they get that plot of land to build their churches and missions on, but they acquired vast acreages of our land following that. 
So, you know, what they ought to do is realize they failed us, and in the spirit of their great benefactor, Jesus Christ, they ought to give that land back, all of it, and all their facilities and institutions. They ought to give it back to the tribe, and we can develop our own school systems, which is what we're doing anyhow. Well, my question was, as these... Is these diff different uh, Christian denominations who are kind of famous for fighting amongst themselves? I mean, even recently, I think the Baptists set out to convert Christians and Episcopalians to to, <coughs> to be Baptists, and the Catholics were all upset about it. Did this have the effect of dividing the community? Did then did the Native people, some of them, view themselves as uh, as Protestant or as Mormon, uh, and and so? I guess, did, did this have an effect of, of affecting the identity that the people had, you know? And you had also mentioned that there were enclaves of traditionalists. You know, where were they? Were they literally out in the remote areas? Oh, uh, yes. And I how did, you know, I guess sort of how did this uh, denominational parceling up affect the social structure of the community? Well, obviously, it, overall, it had a negative impact, but as far as uh, creating more factions, I don't think that was the case. I never did sense that was the case. I think that people always respected one another's visions of what they, how they wanted to worship, so I don't think that was ever the case. But what it did do is that it brainwashed a lot of our people who eventually became leaders under the Indian Reorganization Act, where they deposed our traditional leadership, uh, which we're doing again right now in Iraq, incidentally, the Iraqi Reorganization Act. We already had the Indian Reorganization Act, and one of our prominent leaders, Tony Blackfeather, has written a good paper on that, which can be found on our website under the uh, uh, International uh, Division. But um, uh, it, what it did is it brainwashed a lot of our leaders who became tribal chairmen and members of the council, who oftentimes were uh, more subservient to the white dominant uh, off-reservation and on-reservation communities than they were toward their own people. Um, stripped them of their language, their culture, their traditional spiritual way of life, and uh, many of them sort of function, and I hate to use the term, but I guess it best describes a two-bit facsimile of the dominant uh, oppressor. Um, so it's had a lot of problems, but a lot of our people have now rejected the church, the Christian church, and have gone back to the sacred pipe, the Chinupa, the sweat lodge ceremonies, the sun dances, in the case of the Ojibwe and other tribes up in the Great Lakes region here, the Medewin ceremony, which on other programs I'll have some of our people talk in more depth about the importance of all of that. <clears throat> but what we're doing is we're, we've really developed a new leadership today, a young man, a young woman that has their own language, their own traditional spiritual values, ceremonies, way of life intact. So uh, obviously the American Indian Movement has made a, a major contribution to our future. I met you just about four years ago and uh, have recorded you a lot in, the, in that time and have learned a lot. Um, so I, I've really come to see that the current state of Native affairs in the U.S., and then this extends, of course, up into Canada, it really this extends around the world, because it seems to me there are cultures with many similarities uh, indigenous to places all around the world. Um, it's a complex situation, far more complex than I had ever thought of and I guess I would like to take some time now to explain to people what some of the issues are so I'll list a few things that I've observed and then we can just launch from that I was surprised to find out that there are 
580 federally recognized tribes. Approximately. And there are other tribes who don't have federal recognition who are trying to get it. Mm -hmm. There are federal forces that are trying to decertify some tribes. There are issues of who should be considered an Indian, or, or whether that's by percentage of blood or through adoption. Um, there are people who can be a part of a tribe their whole life and then be suddenly disenrolled by the government that gets in. Um, there are the worst poverty and health statistics. And then in some places now there are casinos where the money is better for the community, but there are suddenly, uh, I'm, I'm going to say, gangsters from Las Vegas lurking in the wings, as well as every other kind of uh, opportunistic person who's attracted to all that big money flow. Um, and, of course, people who didn't... Um, didn't ever have an interest in in their native heritage, whatever percentage of blood they had, suddenly become much more interested when there's a per capita payout or, or other money benefits that are in the wings. So uh, there's a heck of a lot of forces that Indian people have to contend with. And, and within the community of Indian people, there are different disagreements and I guess one of the question, one question relating to what we've been talking about, it also relates here, is uh, I, I'm under the impression that there's always been opportunities for Native people who want to push the white man's agenda or push the capitalist agenda, however you want to press it, um, at the expense of their own people. There's always that kind of job available. So that fact, so whatever factionalism there is, is is encouraged. So I guess at the most, the, looking at all those different kinds of issues, the first question I'll ask is this. 580 tribes. Are those 580 distinct cultures, really distinct cultures? Or are those, can, can you sort of explain what that means and what the relations is? This must be an extreme spectrum of people. Even lumping them together and saying, well, these are Native Americans is probably leaves a lot of the complexity out of what is a large, large group of people. So, y yeah, maybe if you can just talk about sure. who the Native <clears throat> people are in America. Well, there are 500 and some different distinct, uh, uh, they call them tribes. Uh, we think that's sort of demeaning to nationhood and sovereignty, so we often refer to them as nations. Um, to give you an example, first of all, you have the Six Nation Iroquois Confederacy, uh, which is the Seneca, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Tuscarora, and I think Cayuga. I hope I got that right. <laughs> and uh, their languages are somewhat similar, but they're also somewhat different. But they belong to a confederacy called the Six Nations Confederacy. Uh, for ourselves right here in the woodland area of the Great Lakes, we have the Odawa, commonly called Ottawa, uh, Potawatomi, Ojibwa, Menominee, um, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, up in the northeastern part of the United States. Um, so you have several tribes that have pretty much similar languages, yet linguistically different. So you have confederacy, confederations. Uh, what is called the Great Sioux Nation. Uh, Sioux was a, a word that the French uh, put on the Dakota, Lakota and Nakota, and their languages are very similar except da, la, and na. Linguistically, you can distinguish the difference. Um, and of course, the French, in order to demean and to uh, uh, degrade the people, they refer to them as Sioux. 
uh, as they refer to us as the Chippewa, we're the Ojibwa. But some of our people accept the term Chippewa, and some of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota accept the term Sioux. Uh, call it the Great Sioux Nation. So you have groupings of, of nations. Um, a lot of times uh, that's all bound together across what is now called America uh, with a spiritual thread. Uh, the pipe, the tobacco, uh, the sweat lodge, the sun dances, uh, other ceremonies that various nations uh, um, practice yet today. Um, but we're, we're, we're sort of woven together by this common spiritual and cultural thread, uh, which it brings about a certain amount of unification. Uh, most of the nations, um, we have certain gifts that, natural gifts that were given to us by the Gichi Manidu, the Great Spirit, um, however people want to envision that, and that is uh, sage, sweet grass, cedar, Southwest tribes and the Iroquois people used the corn pollen, collected through prayer certain times of the year from the top of the corn. You have uh, the universal uh, medicine or sacrament, the peyote, which many of the tribes across the country, there are many people within those tribes that practice the peyote road way of life as well, in addition to their own traditional ceremonies. And then you have the common medicine or sacrament, which is very sacred, very special, tobacco. Now, tobacco is an Indian word. A lot of people say tobacco. They don't realize what the origins were. But according to our uh, understanding and research, uh, there are so many uh, gifts that are indigenous to North, Central, and South America that they never had in other parts of the world. Uh, to give you an example, of course, squashes, potatoes, pumpkins, beans, um, you could go on and on and list uh, various food, tomato. Uh, makes you wonder what did the Italians do before they stole the pasta from the Chinese and the tomato from us. Uh, I guess that's where the fettuccine Alfredo and all those delicious um, uh, cheese and cream dishes that puts this on uh, uh, came from. But uh, I think there's 12 different types of potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams, uh, food foodstuffs. They're all indigenous to this land. So when these Europeans came over here, boy, they really liked this. They really liked that, all these nice foods, and they were taught how to plant them and how to harvest them and how to prepare them. Uh, but the medicines are very important, the sacred medicines that I described, there's basically six. There may be others, of course, in Central and South America that are being used. But to give you an example to follow that further, a tobacco uh, was never intended to be used the way it's being used today. And there's a difference between tobacco and cigarettes. They've taken tobacco and they put all these different poisons in there. And if people knew what they put in there, nail polish remover, uh, tars, nicotines, carcinogens, uh, uh, death-dealing uh, substances. So they've taken this sacred tobacco and they pumped all these poisons in there and now it's claiming millions of lives worldwide. I think there's about 750,000 people die in this country not to mention those hundreds of thousands that are dying from abusing this sacred gift. And unfortunately, even some of our own people abuse that tobacco, and it has the same impact on, on them and their families, ill health, early death. So uh, the, 
back to the point we're talking about, it's that it's these sacraments, these sacred gifts that sort of bind all the different nations together. Um, now, when we talk about 500 and some tribes, and you mentioned uh, uh, the casinos, well, unless you're near a large population center, such as being near Milwaukee or Chicago or New York City or Minneapolis and St. Paul, there's about two-thirds of the tribes out there that don't have the kind of revenues coming into their casino operations, resort operations, as those tribes that are nations that are near metropolitan areas. So not when people say, well, this particular nation is doing really well with their casinos, those are the exceptions, not the rule. The rule is that our people are still trying to rise out of poverty when they're out in more rural, uh, remote areas away from large population centers. So uh, our people have to be very creative on the type of uh, development, uh, development of their resources, which haven't been exploited yet. And um, so consequently, a lot of our people are ranchers and farmers. We have of, uh, people that have excelled in all the professions. I suppose there are some Indian people that are would be considered very wealthy. Uh, but, uh, you know, our people have been able to overcome a lot of the adversity and, uh, and, and become successful in almost every endeavor that they've taken on. Seems like there are a lot of parallels to the situation, the history uh, with Native people on this continent and other situations, as you, you commented about Iraq, where first of all it is a tribal society and I'm sure that the tribes there, having had thousands of years of contact with the Europeans, have evolved or modified, but they still remain their pro or retain their prominence in the society. Um, and what they're doing to Iraq, it seems, is has many parallels to the techniques that worked pretty well for them here. I, I recently read a, an autobiography of Hitler and one of the things that commented in there was that as a boy he loved playing cowboys and Indians. Of course he was the cowboy. And that later when he was in running Germany he uh, he was very impressed with the American reservation system when he set up his own concentration camps and he was very impressed with using the techniques of starving people out. And I noticed that uh, when you talk about <clears throat> the status of native people prior to 1924 versus after it seems to me this runs parallel to a situation in in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which is right now the Palestinians in the occupied territories and actually I think even the few Israelis who have you know there are some who have married Palestinians and moved there or are just living there as activists um, they sort of have no citizenship but some of the Palestinians um, observe that if the situation as it is goes on long enough, eventually Israel will take it all over and they'll have this population and they may get citizenship. Of course, in the United States here, the native population was a minority when, they, when citizenship was forced on them. In Israel it would be a little different because they have this demographic concern that the Arabs will uh, outnumber the Jews. So I guess I'm just making the observation that, there, that these practices have had a global reach and continue. This is exactly what they're doing in South America or the Middle East today is what they did to the indigenous people here over the hundreds of years. Um, okay, I guess I would move on to... Let me, let me comment on that. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, the European immigrants... Uh, of course, beginning with the colonial pirate Christopher Columbus, uh, and at that time, people in many parts of the world thinking the world was flat and they're going to go a certain distance and fall off into the abyss, uh, which is not a bad idea looking back in retrospect. Um, but they were always afraid of the unknown. They were always afraid of the 
well, they called it the wilderness, this, so, this new world. Again, which wasn't new at all, had been here inhabited by great civilizations of people from the Yukon in the north to the tip of what is now called South America. Great civilizations, very advanced in medicine, architecture, agriculture, astrology, astronomy, um, a very advanced, truly a civilization. A civilization being our relationship with Mother Earth and all the creation of respect and a relationship of respect with one another as the human species. It's like a triangle. Uh, that is truly civilization. When people equate civilization with technology, uh, then they run into trouble. I don't know what is civilized about nuclear bombs and all of these weapons of mass destruction and biological weapons that the United States has an abundance of, incidentally, which we can touch on again when we talk about domestic and foreign policy. But Europeans were always afraid of the wilderness, and that's why they came with their muskets and their sabers. The minute they got off the boat, rather than expect the best and a peaceful people out of uh, from our people coming out to greet them, which we did in many cases, nursed them back to health, showed them how to live in this land, they immediately turned on us and started wiping us out in order to get at the vast riches of resources and the land. Now, almost from the beginning, <clears throat> they started to play cowboys and Indians. Kids running in the woods, the kids always wanted to be the cowboys, they didn't want to be the Indians. I suppose at one time it was pilgrims and Indians, later on cowboys and Indians. And as these people began to buy into this American thing, this Americanization of giving up their own language, their culture, music, dance, traditions, values, uh, they became a completely different species uh, than what they were when they got on the boat. They lost so much. Uh, I think that Caucasian America in particular has the most serious identity crisis that you can imagine. And, you know, we can talk about all of that for several hours, but uh, Americans don't know who they are. And because they don't know who they are, they don't know who we are. And down through the years, they played cowboys and Indians. Um, um, they had to villainize us. In other words, if you want to kill somebody or commit genocide uh, on them, you have to villainize them first. We call that the American rhetoric of genocide. Uh, some of the examples of that would be Injuns, uh, Gooks, Chinks, Wops, Honkies, Spicks, Niggers. You know, they didn't even call us Indians. We were Injuns. That's the rhetoric of genocide. You've got to demean and degrade uh, a people before you can oppress them and wipe them out. So right away, we became the engines. We stood in the way of progress. They seen all that land. They wanted to plant their crops. They wanted to cut the timber down, the forest, and they started to do that. So we were in the way. They no longer seen us as their savior, so to speak, their benefactor, but they seen us as the enemy. And then they committed this terrible holocaust, which, according to experts, 16 to 20 million of us were wiped out. First, military aggression, forced removal from the land, biological warfare, smallpox from Valley Forge, Lord Jeffrey Amherst, a very prestigious university still named after this killer, a city is named after him, Amherst, Massachusetts, was the guy that designed the program to distribute the smallpox disease blankets from Valley Forge among the Indian nations. That process, that policy took place all across the country with other things, diphtheria, uh, tuberculosis. They purposely used biological warfare on us. So we know a little something of biological warfare. Uh, again, military aggression, forced removal from the land, death marches, um, uh, destroyed our orchards, our, our buffalo, our food supply, uh, systematically destroyed. 
uh, starve us into submission. And uh, eventually, when they got to the Pacific coast, they weren't, this insatiable greed had not been satisfied. So then they started moving uh, as the other Spaniards and the Portuguese and the Germans and the Dutch started and the French started to invade Central and South America. The United States also expanded their frontier south and north up into a now what's called Alaska. The Philippines, the horrendous crime against humanity the United States military uh, inflicted on the people of the Philippines in the late 1800s after they had, along with Cuba and Puerto Rico, had won their, and Mexico had won their freedom from Spain. Uh, we know what the United States did in Mexico and uh, uh, Puerto Rico and against the people of Cuba. Uh, we know what they did in the Philippines. Hundreds of thousands of men and women and children were slaughtered in the Philippines by the United States government forces. And uh, it was always for the same purpose. So when we look at the current situation in the Middle East, Israel is nothing more than a stepchild of the United States. What the United States has already done to us and continues to do, they are supporting Israel to continue doing what they're doing to the Palestinians. Now, there was a time that the Palestinians and the Jewish people in what is now called Israel and Palestine, live side by side in peace. I mean, I understand they all come from the same prophet. And uh, there wasn't a conflict until all these European Jews start coming into their, to the country and people from America start, who had already done to us what they're now doing to the Palestinians, uh, began to go in and settle, dispossess Palestinian people from their land, and to bulldoze their homes or move into them and then resettle these immigrants from Europe, from Russia, Poland, other countries of Europe who came into the land of the Palestinian people. So no doubt that the United States continues to support the state of Israel uh, over the rights of the Palestinian people uh, to, the, uh, to the extent that uh, until the Palestinian people and the Jewish people can sit down side by side and work out their differences, there'll continue to be turmoil and uh, death and destruction and suffering in that part of the world.